Yes, great. Well, hi, I'm Denise Stevens. I'm the university librarian here at UCSB. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our inaugural talk in our new Pacific Views Library Speaker Series. It's going to be a feast of both ideas and food with a reception after the talk. The Pacific Views Library Speaker Series, co-sponsored by the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor, was created to showcase new research, publications, and creative work by UCSB faculty and graduate students. The library, as the intellectual and cultural crossroads of campus, welcomes the opportunity to celebrate the accomplishments of our faculty and our students. When we opened our new library that stuff behind us here, in the fall of 2015, not too far away, uh, we will have seen far more space for events like this that will highlight the work of UCSB researchers. In this first year of the series, talks will be offered in the fall and spring quarters. Today, you'll hear from UCSB environmental studies professor David Cleveland. David is a human ecologist and author of the 2014 book, Balancing on a Pl Planet, which is also the title of his talk today. He'll attempt to address the question, can local food improve health, increase equ equity, and slow global warming? His answer might surprise you. David goes beyond the trendy locavore movement to discuss the relationship of local food to agricultural and economic justice. David has had lots of field experience with the subject. He has done research with small-scale farmers around the world in Ghana, Mexico, Pakistan, the Southwest United States, and right here in Santa Barbara County. His, his talk is also co-sponsored by UCSB's Interdisciplinary Humanities Center as part of its series of events devoted to the theme Anthropocene. This term, just added to the Oxford English Dictionary, or in library lingo, the OED, refers to the geological age when human beings have been the dominant influence on the environment, and not always in a good way. Cleveland's book coincides with UC Global Food Initiative, recently announced by the University of California President Janet Napolitano, to bring together UC resources across global food challenges. He will speak for about 45 or 50 minutes, and we'd like for you to hold your questions until he has finished his presentation. At this time, I'd like to welcome David. Thanks, Denise. Uh, is my mic working fine? Okay. How's it sound back there? Okay, perfect. Um, I can getting echoes from myself. So is this? Should we turn this that way? I guess. Okay, my talk today, as Denise said, is uh, bouncing on a planet, and I'm going to talk about local food uh, in the context of improving health, uh, increasing equity, and in, in, uh, slowing global warming. And I want first to just briefly uh, point out that I'm, this is part of a research project uh, the, uh, that I've been working on for years, but also, uh, especially since last fall, been working with um, researchers from uh, Sweden and the UK and um, here at UCSB, including uh, Quentin G, a postdoc here, uh, Daniela Soleri in geography, and these, these five people here are all under, we're all undergraduates last year. Three of them graduated, but they're all environmental studies undergraduates who've been involved uh, in this research. So what's the problem we're going to talk about? Um, we have a global food system that has been very uh, good at increasing food production to keep up with population. And of course, consumption has been increasing at a faster rate than population. So uh, global cereal production, uh, for example, has been very good at keeping up with demand. But it's also produced a lot of hunger. And here we can see uh, just uh, this map that shows the distribution. Uh, darker red areas are areas which are undernourished up to 35% compared with much lower nourishment in the richer industrial countries. But in those richer industrial countries, there's also been a lot of malnutrition, uh, and which has resulted in probably what most of you have heard about, this epidemic of non-communicable uh, diseases. And this, this inflection here in the 70s and this rate of diabetes also corresponds with an inflection and an increased rate of uh, sugar consumption, um, fat consumption, and obesity as well.
And the global food system is a major source of greenhouse gases. Most uh, estimates that you'll see uh, talk about uh, 14, 15 percent uh, of total uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, attributable to agriculture, but that's only production. If we add in the whole food system, production is only about 40 percent. This part is only 40 percent of the food system, and uh, another 60 percent is from all these other things that are normally included in these other categories of uh, sources of greenhouse gases. And if we add in land use change, which is not included uh, in this, in this uh, calculation here, it would even be greater. Climate change also affects the most hungry the most. This is a map of climate change vulnerability. And you can see a pretty much correspondence between the areas of the world that are uh, most undernourished and the areas of the world that are also most vulnerable to climate change. Most vulnerable because of their geographic location and the effects of uh, climate change, but also uh, vulnerable in the sense of not having the resources to adapt to climate change. Climate change will also make it more difficult to produce food. Um, this is uh, the IPCC's 2013. This is the most optimistic scenario, um, the RCP 2.6. And you can see even then um, there will be a, a large area of the planet will uh, experience considerable increases in average temperatures and considerable decreases in rainfall along the middle latitudes and increases in the upper latitudes. And, and this, this, uh, this optimistic scenario, well, it's optimistic compared with this one. Uh, this optimistic scenario uh, is, is based on the use of a lot of new technology like carbon capture and sequestration and a lot of reforestation. So this is, this is not a certain thing. This is dependent upon all those things happening. So what's the solution to the global food system problem that we've just described? Um, well, local food, as you know, you can't not know about local food, right? It's all over the place. Everyone wants to eat local, it seems like. Um, and it's often seen to be spatially local food systems and assumed to result in equitably reduced greenhouse gas emissions, improved health, uh, among other goals for, uh, for as an alternative to the main uh, global food system. But there, there are really two big challenges for localization to be an alternative to that global system. The first is that localization often seems to be part of the dominant uh, supply side strategy of economic growth. And now uh, with the challenges to growth, we have the idea of green growth, that we can continue to grow as long as we do it in a green way. What that means is increasing efficiencies. Uh, this is an example, uh, the local food lab, they're promoting local food. It's a growth industry. It's a hot new market trend. The problem is that increasing efficiencies is not the answer if growth continues. This is a, this is a diagram of, of the United States greenhouse gas emissions and per capita and per dollar uh, of gross domestic product for the United States uh, from 1990 to 2010. And you can see here that real GDP is growing, but also, in addition, there's been a huge increase in efficiency. The United States, California is a, is a major example, has gotten really much more efficient at economic growth. The, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we produce per unit of GDP have gone down. For example, here, 33 percent. The problem is that with growth, there's still about an 11 percent increase in total greenhouse gas emissions. So there's still a net flow to the atmosphere of greenhouse gas emissions, even with this green growth. So I conclude that in the age of the Anthropocene, in this epic Anthropocene epic, we need to decrease consumption to avoid climate catastrophe.
Here we can see population as a proxy for consumption, for demand, and this is a proxy for uh, human impact. This is CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And you notice that, of course, around the Industrial Revolution, both these curves dramatically increase into super exponential growth. Uh, the question is, is there a limit? I think there is a limit. We can't continue to grow uh, if we could keep putting these gases in the atmosphere. Um, the IPCC estimates that um, no more than a two, with no more than 2% increase, it means we need to limit CO2 to about 450 to 500 parts per million. Is that the carrying capacity? How are we going to do that unless we decrease consumption? It's even a greater challenge if Jim Hansen is correct uh, that we need to actually limit the concentration not to 450, 500, but to 350. That's a big challenge because now, what's the concentration now of CO2 in the atmosphere? It's, it's, it's close to 400 now, depending on how you calculate. It goes up and down with the seasons. And that, of course, doesn't include other greenhouse gases, which are also been increasing. So if, if, if that's true, we're not only going to have to stabilize concentrations in the atmosphere by slowing growth, but we're actually going to have to be taking more out of the atmosphere than we're putting into it for a considerable period of time in order to lower the concentration down to 350. So this is a big challenge. This means that high consuming populations need to reduce the most. Uh, as we've seen, the, high, the, the richer nations are producing most of the CO2. Um, here's just some examples. Uh, this, of course, the redder, the red end of the spectrum is the high producing uh, nations. The blue end is the low producing nations. Uh, Niger, uh, uh, compared with Niger, the United States uh, per capita and this is total emissions. This is all greenhouse gases. This is CO2 equivalents. The United States uh, per person emits about 35 times what every person in Niger em emits and about over three times what every person in Portugal emits. How are we going to do this? Well, fortunately, there seems to be a lot of room for decreasing consumption and the accompanying greenhouse gas emissions without decreasing quality of life. Here's just an example. Here's life expectancy on this, uh, on the y-axis and on the x-axis, per capita consumption uh, uh, energy. And we can see here that the United States and Portugal, Portugal, which two and a half times less, are about the same life expectancy. Whereas Niger, with a life expectancy of 56 years, is way down here in terms of energy consumption. So, these countries over here need to reduce so that these countries have the opportunity to improve their quality of life. The second big challenge for localization, I think, is the lack of appropriate indicators. For example, um, are food miles really a good way to judge a food system? There seems to be, a, there's a kind of a, a categorical error in saying that global food systems causing the problem. Local is the opposite of global. Therefore, everything that makes global bad is included in local and making everything good. That's the common assumption. So one of the things we did a few years ago is we looked at uh, food miles in Santa Barbara County. We just looked at this for produce, for fruits and vegetables. Um, Santa Barbara County's uh, agriculture, about 86% of our total agricultural production in terms of value is fruits and vegetables. So we, <coughs> we looked at fruits and vegetables and we saw that um, only about four or five percent of all the fruits and vegetables we eat here in Santa Barbara County are actually grown here. Meanwhile, we're exporting 99 percent. Incredible. We're importing 96 percent. Why, why does this make sense? Does it make sense? 
What do you think? <laughs> Doesn't seem to make sense. So there's a big local food movement in Santa Barbara County, as in many places in the United States and around the world. Uh, and one of the, I think, assumptions here is often that reducing food miles is going to do, produce all these good things as an alternative to the global food system, including reducing food miles. So we, we did research, um, interviewed grocery stores, farmers markets, uh, collected data from UCSB residential dining to estimate uh, how much food grown here is actually consumed here. And this is what we found, that localizing produce consumption 100% would have a very minor effect on greenhouse gas emissions because transportation is a small part of the total food system uh, impact on the climate. So localization may not be the solution if it contributes to increasing consumption, if there are no good indicators for real goals of, alter of alternative food system. However, diet change can be the key to local food as an alternative because diet change is a way to reduce consumption and growth, reduce emissions, and it also can provide measurable indicators for equitably reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving nutrition. Fortunately, there's a great synergy between the foods that are good for us and the foods that are good for the planet. Can you imagine if that wasn't the case? Can you imagine that all the good foods that really made us healthy also were the worst thing for the planet? We'd be in a real fix. But guess what? That's not the case. We're lucky. And interestingly enough, people from both the food angle and the climate angle are recommending the same plant-based diets, the same diets that emphasize these and not these things. Um, Kim Williams, the president-elect of the American College of Cardiology, um, started a plant-based diet 10 years ago for health reasons, because he knows what the data are that relate consumption of some foods to cardiovascular disease. And Rajendra Pachauri, the uh, chairman of the IPCC, promotes a plant-based diet because he knows the data about what these foods do to the climate. So this is the research we've been doing the last year, where we modeled diets to, to see what is the actual potential of diet change to achieve um, these different goals for an alternative to the global food system. So we, we started with a standard American diet, a standard not in the sense that this is the standard to live up to, but standard in the sense that this is what people eat based on of the data that the USDA collects. So this is the standard American diet. And we chose to uh, change foods in this diet based on uh, USDA and other recommendations for healthy foods. And also based on uh, meta-analyses, high quality meta-analyses, meta-analyses that reported relative risk uh, for disease from eating certain foods. So this is, these are, this is the standard American diet, and we model these three uh, what we call healthy alternative diets. And so one of the main changes that, that we happened in this diet, what, uh, these alternative diets, is that uh, red and processed meat was reduced to zero. Fruits and vegetables, uh, according, this is based on USDA recommendations, uh, about doubled for all these diets. Uh, beans and peas increased to replace uh, protein uh, in the meat. And whole grains uh, increased quite a bit, while refined grains also decreased. So what did we find? Well, we found that for, for uh, downstream, we, we divided this into two things. Upstream, 
uh, was, is the greenhouse gas emissions from all the food that's produced. Downstream is, is the effect of the food after you eat it. So, uh, for example, in these three diets, there was a reduction in coronary heart disease between 40 to 45 percent, in type 2 diabetes uh, between 35 and 43 percent, and colorectal cancer 20 to 29 percent. Healthcare costs decreased by, uh, by about a third, $72 billion would be the decrease in healthcare costs, and a significant decrease also in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Because healthcare uses resources. All those ambulances, those hospitals, those, um, those, all the equipment the doctors use. The, uh, one of the things that was really interesting I've been just learning about is anesthetic gas is, very, is a very potent greenhouse gas. And only about 5%, if when you have an operation, you get, uh, uh, they give you uh, anesthetic, or, um, only about 5% of that is absorbed by the body. The other 95% is emitted into the atmosphere. Um, so, uh, anesthesia it can be a, a major a form of greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, here you just see the, the chart for these three different um, diets for three different global warming potentials, which I'll talk about in a second. And our results actually uh, only included a small portion of the potential food changes and diet risk factors. So this is very conservative. We did the, the only things we changed in the diet are those foods I told you about. So the rest of the standard American diet remained the same. High consumption of added sugar, high consumption of dairy uh, and other products. So we only changed uh, a portion of the diet and we only included a portion of the diseases that uh, are associated with the foods that we did change because the data for the other uh, uh, relationships weren't as robust as the ones we used. We wanted to be very conservative. And it also produced, uh, reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, upstream. Uh, in other words, in the production, processing, transport, and so on. And this is compared, this is the emissions in the standard American diet, and these are in our healthy alternative diet one, two, and three. And the reason that this stays the same for three is that this is uh, the, the um, healthy alternative diet three has no red meat in it. So <clears throat> that's where most of the methane comes from. It's from uh, um, ruminant animals, mainly cows. And so um, this has a very low greenhouse gas emissions and our results again are limited because we didn't even include, because data are not available to include retail to consumer, post-consumer waste, or land use change in these emissions. So again, this is a conservative estimate. And so overall diet change can significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And most of uh, the IPCC reports, when they estimate the, the emissions, they're all using a very conservative estimate for the warming potential of methane, which is one of the biggest uh, greenhouse gases from the food system. They use this global warming potential of 21 based on a 100 year time frame, but they have actually revised it, the 100 year time frame to 34 times carbon dioxide. And if you look at a 20 year time frame, it's 86 times. In other words, every, every molecule of carbon dioxide, the molecule of methane is 86 times as powerful a greenhouse gas. And there's, there's no reason not to use a 20 year time frame. The 100 year time frame is totally arbitrary and 20 years makes more sense because we need to, we need to deal with this issue f very quickly. We don't have 100 years to figure this out. And methanes, if we can reduce methane, will have a rapid effect because it has most of its effect during the first 20 years. So methane is a really important uh, greenhouse gas to reduce. So how about compare, what does this really mean in terms of com other mitigation measures? 
Well, for example, this is Obama's climate action plan for the United States, 17 cent percent reduction below 2005 levels by 2020. If we look at our most uh, optimistic scenario, our had number, our healthy alternative diet number three, uh, with a greenhouse with a global warming potential for methane of 86, it would if everyone in the United States adopted that diet tomorrow, we could begin reducing. We could begin meeting Obama's target, 37 percent of his target. We could, we could be meeting. Does anyone know what Obama's plans are for reaching that target? What is he thinking of? How, are, how is he planning to reach that target? Investing in natural energy. In what kind of energy? Like alternative, alternative energy, like wind power and things like that. Nuclear. Nuclear is also on his list. Yeah, nuclear. Um, yeah, fuel standards. Yeah, how do you, how do you, what is going on? Sorry. <laughs> I, I'd, I can't stand close to that. Uh, that doesn't like me. Um, so how, do, how, how are fuel standards adjusted? Um, he's made it required that all new cars that are produced have higher fuel efficiency. Right, new cars. Yep. So to, to meet his goals, you would have to produce a lot of new cars. <laughs> what happens to the old cars? What happens, how do you make new cars? Diet change doesn't require making new cars. <laughs> it doesn't, what it requires, we'll talk about in a minute, what it requires is also something pretty challenging, and that is making new thoughts. Okay, let's look at, uh, so, oh, yeah, I, uh, we did this calculation that this amount, this amount of Obama's uh, uh, target would be equivalent to installing 131 wind turbines. 131 wind turbines, just by slightly changing your diet and being healthier. Uh, we also looked at, at, a, base, at a baseline. Uh, as you know, uh, California's uh, Climate Act, AB 32, its main target is to reach 1990 levels of emissions by 2020. And our uh, had number three with a global warming potential of 86 would achieve 154%. If everyone in California adopted that had three diet, we would reach 154% of the target for AB 32. And you can imagine, what if half the people in California only went half the way on that diet? It would still be significant, wouldn't it? It'd still be a big chunk of that target with no investment. How, what's, what are the goals for AB 32? What are the main mechanisms for implementing uh, AB 32? Anybody know? Well, we have, uh, there are mandates for different uh, jurisdictions in California. The mandates in, are mainly focused on housing and transportation. Again, things that require a lot of infrastructural change, um, new construction, and so on. So our next question, since diet change can help localization reach goals like reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving nutrition by reducing consumption and growth and providing indicators of progress toward goals like climate labeling of foods, nutritional status, diabetes incidence, and diet change doesn't depend on new technologies or infrastructure, but it does require behavior change, as I said, and that, of course, is a huge challenge. One of the interesting things about diet is that um, people are very conservative with diets. Uh, we've we've uh, worked with um, a bit with Oaxacan immigrants to uh, California, and um, Oaxacan food is, is at the pinnacle of world cuisine, as you may know. It's just in incredibly good food. And so when people move here from Oaxaca, they're thinking, oh my God, we're in a food desert. The United States is a food desert. What are we going to do? Well, they start importing stuff from Oaxaca um, because they don't want to change their diets. And yet, diets do change, sometimes very dramatically. Sometimes, often the second generation or third generation of people who move here from Oaxaca, their diets are completely different. So we have this conundrum of diet change being very conservative in many ways and also being very 
um, plastic, very easy to change in some ways. The question is, what are the determinants? And we really don't know that much about it at this point. However, information is important. Um, Williams and Pachauri changed their diets based on the information they had. As experts in nutrition and disease and expert, uh, as an expert in climate change, they changed their diets. So if we have more information, is that what we need? Um, this is an uh, experiment that was done, uh, was published in 2012. And it's very interesting because uh, their, their hypothesis was that um, the amount of the way people perceive the risk of crime, climate change would be related to how well they understood climate change. So they, they had their um, experimental uh, subjects. Um, these are psychologists, so they have experimental subjects. And um, so they, had, they, they categorized the people ahead of time by whether they were hierarchical individualists or egalitarian communitarian. Uh, you might say Tea Partyists and Progressive Democrats. If you wanted to put labels on it. Um, you don't have to. But anyway, uh, so, so based on their, their uh, preliminary uh, screening tests and so on, they categorized these people, as have, these people had low perceived risk of climate change. These people had a high perceived risk. And this is their hypothesis, that with additional information, these people would be more concerned about climate change. What do you think happened when they gave more information? Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened. So what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean for the future of diet change? Well, it shows that we, one of their conclusions based on other data is that values and peer groups are also important. Information alone, empirical information alone doesn't seem to change the way we think about things. It, values are really important. Values can motivate collective action for institutional change. Um, Berkeley, California, two weeks ago, the first city in the United States to pass a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages, one penny an ounce. And researchers at UC San Francisco uh, a couple of years ago modeled what that could result in. Again, similar to our research, they showed that uh, this huge reduction in uh, this is for the whole of the United States. This huge reduction in diseases plus $17 billion in savings. Of course, the soda industry did not like this. Uh, values also can motivate, has motivated changes right here in Santa Barbara County. Um, this is uh, Wesley Slight and Anna Bro who uh, started uh, um, Farmer Direct Produce about six or seven years ago in collaboration with our own residential dining and they were able to uh, establish this incredible network of connecting our local farmers with residential dining, Peabody School, Santa Barbara Su City School System and other uh, schools and what was their main motivation? We did a case study of, the, of this food hub and we found their main motivation was they wanted to improve nutrition. They've both been working at the farmer's markets uh, here in Santa Barbara County, and they were just appalled at how much good food got wasted. And then they would go into the, into the lunchrooms in the schools, and they would say, oh, what are these kids eating? And they're, wait a minute, there's a, there's a problem here. We have all this good food going to waste, and yet the kids are eating food that's not so good. So this was their mission, and for, a number of years, they basically, sub they had subsistence or below subsistence income from, they were doing other things as well. Their motivation was not economic growth. It wasn't making a lot of money. Their motivation was better food. I just want to end with another, another example of how, of, of how motivation and values in food can affect um, uh, major movements for food justice. And 
uh, for example, uh, Richard Ray Perez uh, was a co-director of a film that came out in 2000, not the Hollywood version of Cesar Chavez's uh, life, his, that hagiog hagiographic film, but this was uh, a documentary uh, film based on footage that was shot uh, especially during his fast in 1988. And uh, he told this story in an interview that he was a four-year-old kid in Los Angeles and he was at a Head Start program. And the Head Start, the stuff they got for lunch was often this fruit cocktail. You know, the kind of syrupy stuff that comes out of cans. And one of the things in, the, in that slurry on the kids' plates were grapes. And um, Ray Perez is a four-year-old kid sitting there, and he, he noticed his, his teacher was plucking the grapes out of his, his lunch and just putting them aside, wasn't eating them. And he said, why are you doing that? And he said, well, I'm doing this because there's a boycott uh, on grapes because the people who grow the the people who grow the grapes are not treated very well they're not paid very well and we're boycotting grapes to force the people who are hiring these people to give them better a better uh, working situation and all of a sudden Ray Perez looked at those grapes on his on his plate and they weren't just grapes anymore they just weren't these sweet things that you could eat and tasted good and all of a sudden, those grapes were imbued with values. And the eating of those grapes became a social statement about values. So our, I think our challenge is to reorient our relationship to food, because food has such a huge impact on climate. It has this, such a huge impact on our health and the health of our kids. It has such a huge impact on the inequities between the people who don't have enough food and the people who have too much food. And so somehow the challenge is to have local food systems, which have a lot of good things about them per se, just being local food systems. How do we imbue the food in those systems with these kind of values so that localizing our food system can actually address the real problems of the global food system? Thank you. Questions. I hope this. I hope this. Uh, I hope a lot of you said, "Is he crazy? What's he talking about?" Because you'll have good questions. Yes, Carla. Yeah, of course it matters. Of course it matters. Yeah. Well, this is one of the things about local food also, is that local food, it's produced in the community. So people know about who's producing it oftentimes. And so um, a lot of local farmers, for example, don't do organic certification. We just talked to the Fair Hill uh, farms, the people who produce all those apples and Paso Robles the other day, and they drop their, they've been certified for I think 20 some years, and they drop their organic certification. So we don't need it. People know what we do well. And, and that's one of the advantages of a local food system, is that you get to know what people are doing. People don't want to live next to a farm that's spraying a lot of toxic chemicals. And there's a correlation between small farms, farms that are close to cities, and farms that sell direct locally. So. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. But, but your modeling is just... My food. modeling is just fruits and vegetables. And most of these, uh, most of the meta-analyses that we looked at do not consider the, whether the food is organic or not. These are just strict uh, epidemiological or data, most of it, um, and it doesn't include that. So probably the gains would even be more if they were organic. Yeah. So is that Josh? Josh. Oh, I'm sorry, but... I couldn't see you. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. So right now we're facing a catastrophic drought, and the local food system is therefore much more vulnerable to local environmental disruption, where the local food system allows us to export droughts while importing food. Yep. So how do you balance those kinds of sustainability issues? 
Yeah, I mean, that's all. I don't think most people advocating a local food system aren't saying, you know, they're not like that guy in New York City went to his apartment and didn't emerge for a year because he wanted to be totally local. But um, I think we're always going to be importing stuff. And it's a balance. Again, if you, if you look at the indicators, what is local food doing? And it's often less greenhouse gas intensive to import food from somewhere. For example, in the UK, if they grow tomatoes in the winter in the UK, they, they, they're better off importing them from southern Italy in terms of their impact on the environment. Um, so it's all relative. And it also depends on how, how seasonal we want to be. I mean, are we going to demand to have tomatoes all year round? Are we going to demand to have bananas, even though we hardly grow any here in Santa Barbara County? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of more subtleties in, in, in this thing that I presented. But um, these are all good questions. All, the, the point is that we sh these are things we ought to be talking about. These are the issues. Instead of talking about how we can get uh, car makers to uh, increase the gas mileage in their cars, or, or getting um, um, what is the, the uh, uh, sugar sweetened beverage industry has pledged to reduce um, the amount of sugar consumption over the next X number of years when already the trend is going down. So they're basically saying we'll, be, we'll, take, we'll take credit for what's already happening. I mean, you know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues we really ought to be talking about. And I think that's the important thing. We don't have the answers. I mean, yeah, I don't know, I'll shut up. Oh, yeah. What's, go ahead. Again, all these things are possible. I think the important thing is indicators. If you're going to grow hydroponic food, what's the, what's the net environmental impact? So you do a life cycle assessment. And you look at what's the impact of all the, all the chemicals, what's the impact of the infrastructure for hydroponics, and so on. And I, I don't know. Um, it, if it's also true in terms of alternatives to our water-intensive agricultural system. We're spending about 80% of the water in, Cal in California and worldwide, 75 to 80% of fresh water withdrawals are for producing food. That's most of our water. So have you heard of aeroponics? A way of growing food with only chemicals under water? What's aeroponics? A way to grow food with only chemicals under water. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's lots of ways to do this. Another question is scale and, and cost as well as uh, and, uh, impact. Santa Barbara County used to produce a lot of food uh, when the European invaders came, a lot of agricultural food without irrigation. It was mostly rain fed. We go rain fed. Mediterranean climate, we had winter rain. We didn't use irrigation. As soon as there's irrigation water, farmers will use it, because why not? The question is, instead of, instead of in the face of drought, instead of thinking, how can we maintain the water supply to keep growing what we're growing, maybe we should be thinking, how can we adapt to a reduced water supply and still have healthy food? I mean, there's different ways. Yes. Yeah, that's, the, um, that's an issue, and I think, of course, part of that issue is the whole economic structure of our system and the fact that, um, you know, the big surge in, in um, high fructose corn syrup consumption was fueled by the subsidies that came in in the 70s for corn. Um, so we're still subsidizing this food, um, and, and I think that um, if we added the, the externalized costs onto the junk food, if we, if, if we made junk food um, manufacturers pay the cost of the disease that's caused and of the climate change that's caused by producing and selling those foods, maybe they would be more expensive. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, it would be a much more level playing field. Yes. Oh, Simone. So, if I remember correctly, the greenhouse gas story mm -hmm. about diet change mm -hmm. Right, it, it's both. The, 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 big, the big change was uh, the upstream. Oh, so the green was upstream. Yeah, the, the blue on the top was the downstream. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. 
So, so healthcare contributes. It could contribute a lot more if we included, some people estimate that what, our, uh, what we estimated from this limited thing could be 10 times as much if all the food-related diseases were included. But, you know, it's, it's a messy, messy situation. It's hard to really interpret that. Yeah? Um, do you think we're going to get to the point where people will change their food diet um, uh, to, to cut out red meat? Um, or do you think it'll be pressed upon us because the cost of meat will eventually go so high people won't be able to afford it? Um, I, as a vegetarian, I, I, people are offended automatically sometimes just by being a vegetarian yeah. because they think that you're trying to, to make a statement on yeah. onto them. And so, a moral statement. And, and red meat yeah. isn't even an addictive substance like sugar yeah. or, or flour that I, that I know of. So, so understanding the cultural like significance toward why people eat what they eat. And I understand what you're saying with increasing costs and, da, 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 you know, and all that, but what it seems like yeah. one foot's going to drop yeah. before the other. Yeah. Yeah, the, most surveys that are done of people's food choices, they find that convenience and habit are the two biggest, they're the two biggest determinants of what people eat. So convenience and habit has also a lot to do with our food environments. And so I think changing environments, uh, there's been experiments done in schools where um, they take the sodas out of vending machines and put in um, fruits and vegetables in vending machines, mm -hmm. and they lower the price, and kids buy them. <laughs> kids buy them. So, uh, you know, experiments done in school gardens show that when, when students get, you know, they may be addicted to junk food, uh, but when they get the experience of eating some of this kind of food, along with the values of working with other people and growing it themselves, their tastes change. So it is possible. I think the, the huge obstacle we're up against is the food industry. Because while there, there's a synergy between foods that are friendly to the climate and good for your body, there's also a synergy between foods that are bad for your body and foods with high profit margins. So the food industry has not a lot of incentive to uh, sell you healthy food. They want to sell you highly processed, more addictive type of foods with lots of salt and sugar in them. And how do we, how do, we do that? How do we get control of our food system? That's what the soda tax is partly about. Uh, in the back, Ken. Uh, yeah, great talk, David. Can I have a question regarding uh, fruit and vegetable stuff, I mean, uh, especially your organic ones, mm -hmm. relying on nature? I just got really fast on that. So, you know, when you go to the store, even if you're a vegan, you buy organic lettuce, mm -hmm. often it requires the meat industry to provide the fertilizer for that. So, is that meat, is that something that most foods put up, or is there a real foundation for that? Uh, you mean in manure, yeah. uh, blood meal, bone meal, that kind of thing? Yeah, so I mean, what does the reliance for organics have on that? Because if you did switch over to market and plant-based, you've got to get away from the meat industry, and then what's the use of fertilizer, what's the source of these uh, fossil fuel based? Well, um, a lot of farmers don't use those kind of animal uh, byproducts. Um, a lot of them use manure. I know, for example, John Gibbons gets the manure from the uh, fairgrounds or the horse manure. Um, but a lot of our organic waste can be composted and used. It's not as high a nutrient density as the animal stuff, but it still can provide the basis for, for um, producing fruits and vegetables. So it's still possible. Yes? They had turkeys. They had turkeys in Oaxaca. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, I mean, that, that's true. I mean, we, we tend to get a, 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 all of us, we tend to get accustomed to the way things are and assume that that's the norm and it's so hard to change. But there are many. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot of regulations on farmers, period, you know. I mean, farmers who are conventional have to, you know, file pesticide application, have to permits and so on. 
um, organic farmers uh, obviously have a big burden because they have to keep records of things. For example, if, if you want to make your own compost on your farm, if you want to take your um, you know, crop uh, debris and compost it, you have to keep, tra you have to measure the temperature, you have to keep records, uh, and, and it's just really an onerous thing. This is why Fair Hill uh, Farms decided to drop their organic certification. So, yeah, I think it's, a, it, it's, it's seen as an obstacle to a lot of alternative methods. You know, the whole scare with the, with the um, uh, salad greens and the, and the salmonella and stuff, um, the response was, okay, farmers need to take out their hedgerows, they need to eliminate any kind of habitat for, for um, mammals in their, or near their farms, and so it's like these, the, the, the whole food safety thing is working against small-scale alternative farmers, unfortunately. Yes? Yeah, it's made me think more. I'm vegan, but I have to confess that I am vegan. Um, but it's, it's, what it made me realize is that you really do need to, to understand the whole impact. I mean, a, a plant-based diet is not automatic. Just local food is not automatically uh, going to solve all the problems of the global food system. And a plant-based diet isn't automatically going to solve uh, those problems either because um, you know, you can be eating tofu that's made with soybeans grown in Brazil where rainforests have been cut down. Um, so you have to really understand the whole process, the whole life cycle that produced the food you're eating. And that, I think that's the main thing that I've been thinking of more is not just categorizing foods as this is a good food, that's a bad food. I kind of did that today for simplicity. But we really do need to think about all the things that produce that food. Uh, for example, local food is often produced by um, migrant workers. Uh, organic food, especially because organic farmers can't use herbicides, they have to do a lot more hand weeding than conventional farmers who can just spray herbicides very conveniently. That means organic farmers are even more dependent on cheap migrant labor than conventional farmers. Migrant labor is mostly not local, as we all know. So, you know, there's all these complications that come in. But again, I think this is the kind of conversation that we need to be having if we really want to tackle this and we don't want to just throw all our um, hopes uh, at technology. Oh, technology is going to solve this. I don't think it's going to solve it. Economic growth isn't going to solve it. Green growth isn't going to solve it. We need to really be thinking in alternative ways. And that's what it really, that's what it really this research has been making me think more and more about all the details. Yes? Where can recent graduates be what? Uh, my classes. <laughs> uh, I, I always tell, I tell people, no matter, you're, anyone's welcome to yeah. sit in on the classes. You can audit the classes. It's, you know, it's a public university. You're welcome to anyone. You can look up the classes and come in and I try to have all my classes be conversational so we actually discuss these things. But there's also a lot of other, um, there's a food action plan being um, promulgated for Santa Barbara County. We have a, a food policy council. What's the name of the food policy council? It changed its name. For, anyway, we do have a food policy type council in Santa Barbara County. Uh, we have a very active um, uh, uh, progressive food bank. We have community gardens. Uh, so there's lots of venue where you could get involved where people will be talking about these kind of things. Yes? Mm-hmm. without challenging people's identities? <laughs> yeah, I think, but I think that, you know, the whole, um, I think the key to that is how people think about the quality of their life. And, you know, we're, I, I think this is one of the key things of the Anthropocene is, is that we, that we're, you know, we've been, ha we've had a Neolithic strategy for dealing with um, 
human problems for 13,000 years since the beginning of agriculture. So it's a, it's a, it's a supply side mentality. It's demand is growing, how are we gonna reach that supply? Almost every textbook in plant breeding and agronomy, if you pick that textbook up, it'll say the main challenge is producing enough food for growing demand, a growing population and people eating higher off the food chain. That's the big problem that's solved. That's a Neolithic mentality and somehow I think the Anthropocene offers us the opportunity to rethink that 13,000 year old strategy and to start thinking more in a, in a demand side strategy. And if there are limits, we have to limit our demand. And I think, uh, I think imbuing uh, that into the way people think about uh, their food is, is a really important thing. And even while information about the climate is not, just information per se, is not going to change people as we've discussed. The, the challenge is, like those grapes that uh, Ray Perez ate, the, the challenge is to get people to see climate change not just as, a, as a something out there, but something that is intimate to them. And I think that is going to get people to start rethinking their identities and stop thinking of their identities as so much as consumers and their, their welfare as increasing consumption, but think about it in different ways, in socially proactive ways. Um, there's a really interesting research that um, um, David Yeager, who's a psychologist from UT Austin, he was here a couple weeks ago. Uh, he's a graduate of um, Stanford. and. Um, He's been working with, with the teenage kids in Texas and what he's been do he did this experiment where he, he gave the kids information about the food they were eating, uh, you know, junk food, and said, well, this food isn't, you know, this is, these are the data, this food is not so good for you, it'll make you sick eventually, and so on. And then he would wa he'd monitor them making choices, you know, like in the lunchroom, you know, without any, you know, without, they didn't know they were being monitored. They didn't change much. But he explained to, he did another, uh, another uh, treatment, was to explain to the kids how the food corporations were trying to manipulate their tastes and their, and their food choices. And they changed their food choices because they, their identity was that they had the ability to make decisions themselves and that identity was threatened it gave their food choices a social purpose, and so they changed. So how do we, how do we get social purpose into our food? I think that is the challenge. Yes? Well, for example, with myself, I won't buy a product if, um, as far as corn or soybeans, if it's not healthy or organic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but you have a, your food is imbued with your values. Yes. Yeah. So maybe we can um, hold some of the questions now because we're gonna have a reception afterwards and David's gonna be around um, in the lobby. Uh, we have books of his for sale. On behalf of the library, I wanna thank David Cleveland so much. And he has okay. Oh, thanks. Um, and Local food. Uh, for you to sample, some of this food was donated. Um, so we'd like to thank Salty Girl Seafood for donating 20 pounds of local Ridgeback shrimp, and the Isla Vista Food Co-op for donating wraps. Um, again, as I said, copies of David's book, Balancing on the Planet, are for sale courtesy of the UCSB Bookstore. If you don't mind filling out an evaluation form and letting us know um, what you thought of this event and what other kinds of events you'd like to see, in the library, uh, that would be great. So enjoy the reception, and again, thank you so much to David Cleveland for being our inaugural speaker and for all of you to come out. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Is it good? Pardon? We need a movie. Yeah.
Let's. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. Good. How are we going to get small folders? I'm just finishing a book trying to get all the details off my uh, desk, and it's all about the Maya Forest Garden, looking at the past.